Okay, uh, so welcome. So I've shown here on the screen, you know, the the basic physics of the uh, problem we've been studying so far, which is electrons moving a uniform positive background. Uh, so in this uh, screen, you see the the value of imaginary part of the region of Q and omega space where imaginary part of chi and Q and omega is non-zero. Um, and there's two basic types types of excitations, uh, which have there's the particle hole continuum, uh, and these you can basically think of uh, very simple excitations where you take a fermion from inside the Fermi surface and put it outside the Fermi surface, uh, and you're simply asking at what moment uh, and energy that you can do that, uh, and so you get this continuum, uh, which also has lots of zero energy excitations. Uh, zero energy excitations, meaning you can take a particle just inside the Fermi surface and put it just outside the Fermi surface. So the energy is practically zero. Uh, and this can be done up to momentum 2kf when you take a particle across the diameter, uh, but not beyond that. If you want to have a momentum larger than that, then you have to uh, pay some energy cost. Uh, and you know, how much energy cost? Well, that tells you, this tells you here. So if you want this large momentum, this is the minimum energy you have to pay uh, to create uh, an excitation, this energy omega. Uh, and these very low energy excitations near the Fermi surface uh, make the system compressible and also uh, lead to screening. So the charges are able to move around very easily when you put a perturbation uh, and that perturbation uh, then can be screened and there's perfect screening so that the net charge of the screening cloud is the same as the uh, the external charge that you put in. And the fact that zero energy excitations end at 2kf also has important consequence. It leads to Friedel oscillations. Uh, that leads to the fact that the density oscillates with the wave vector 2kf. And this is in fact one of the best ways today of measuring 2kf. Uh, then we also learned that there's another very important sort of excitation which requires the Coulomb interaction, which is not present for free electrons. Uh, and this uh, this is the plasmon, and this appears basically because anytime there's a local density fluctuation, that leads to a, a Coulomb force, uh, and then you can set up a harmonic oscillator where positive and negative charges are oscillating with this plasma frequency. So the dielectric constant uh, of a metal is negative below the plasma frequency and positive above the plasma frequency. And that's why metals are reflective uh, because of the presence of this plasma mode. Uh, so the plasma on is present, is in, in fact, in the approximation we computed it, it was totally flat, independent of Q. Um, there will be some curvature and there will also be slight amount of broadening, uh, but it's pretty well defined and flat until it hits the particle hole continuum when it uh, becomes a very short lived excitation, uh, which can decay into particle hole pairs. Uh, okay, so that's a summary of really the basic important physical properties of the electron gas. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, this yellow line is the dispersion of the plasma uh, in two dimensions, which is where it's also well defined. Uh, uh, and so apart from that difference, there's not much difference in the theory of an electron liquid in two rather than three. Uh, the fact that the plasma goes to, to zero energy at Q goes to zero. Uh, but in one dimension, the picture is completely different. There is no particle hole continuum. Uh, and you're going to work out in the homework problem, the next, uh, what the, what this picture, how this picture changes in one dimension, at least a little bit. Uh, there's many other things that happen in 1D that we're not going to cover in this course. Uh, that we covered a bit on 268R. Okay. Um, yes, any questions? All right, well then uh, the course is kind of, so we've done a lot of physics and you know, my strategy here has been to do as much as physics as possible with the minimum of formalism uh, and the basic tricks we have used are extremely powerful and really on practice, they are generally the only tricks you need. Uh, and the tricks are, well, uh, you take a variational wave function, and then using that, you get a Hartree-Fock approximation. 
And then if you want dynamic response functions, uh, you do the time-dependent Hartree-Fock or the RPA. And this way you can get uh, quite a lot. But there are a few things that you don't get with this approach, uh, like the lifetime of the particle and then some of the spin fluctuations that uh, we haven't fully accounted for. Uh, and you know the fact that this thing broadens a little bit. Uh, so there are other things we would like to compute. Uh, and... Uh, you know, some of those can be done in ad hoc manner using Boltzmann equations or Fermi's golden rule. Uh, but to do it fully systematic, you need some formalism. Uh, so I'm going to now develop the formalism. Uh, uh, you know, I won't uh, of Green's functions and Feynman diagrams. Uh, I'll outline the basic ideas and show you the rules and give you a reference of where you can read about it. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, you know, and it's useful to know the language even for experimentalist that uh, of Green's function because it sharpens how you talk about many body systems, uh, even if you're not going to be doing a two loop calculation anytime in your life. Uh, <laughs> then you can consider yourself lucky. Uh, so, but so that's I'll try to do it in a way that I, you know, don't spend too much time on it, uh, but get to the basic physical features of it. Uh, because ultimately, uh, if you're clever enough, you can all, you can usually do without it. <laughs> but it's good; it's a language that becomes so common now that everyone should know it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you t take any textbook, including our textbook, they do the Green's function much earlier, and then get to plasmons and particle continuums much later. I, I prefer to do it the opposite order because then the first half of the course is nothing but fairly boring formalism. All right, so that's kind of the change we're going to make. Uh, oh, before one more thing I wanted to say. So this kind of this picture here is a summary of the property of the electron gas with respect to any perturbation that doesn't actually remove an electron from the system. So for example, electric field, uh, uh, x-rays, whatever, uh, any kind of uh, shake the system, you can, you can figure out the response related to chi, corresponding response related to chi. Uh, the other uh, important excitation the probe that you have is photoemission. You send in light and knock an electron out. Uh, and that measures the quasi-particle dispersion. And we also talked about the quasi-particle dispersion in the Hutchifock theory. Uh, and in fact, there we found that the dispersion was very strongly modified uh, and went from, uh, you know, had this logarithmically divergent effective mass at the Fermi level. Now we'll see, in fact, the, that's not me divergent. And the reason it's not divergent is because of screening. Uh, and exactly how to, to do that calculation? Okay, it's good to know a little bit of diagrams. So that's kind of where we are going. All right, so actually I won't jump into diagrams today, most likely. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a set of, this is actually more important than diagrams and everyone should definitely know these things. Uh, these are spectral representations and the fluctuation dissipation theorem, uh, which will also be useful when we study diagrams and uh, also tie up some loose ends uh, into our discussion uh, of the electron gas. Okay, so this is a very general technique, uh, applies to all kinds of Green's functions and response function, but let's apply it to the, the one response function we have met so far, that's the Kubo formula, with the correlation function of the density with itself. So this is the definition of the Kubo formula, where rho of kt uh, is the density at momentum k and time t. Actually, in all of these spectral rules, um, they basically act in frequency and time space and energy space, uh, and the momentum just goes along for the ride. So I'll just kind of keep a momentum label and not pay too much attention to it. Uh, if you're in a disordered system, there is no momentum, but still there are, even then the, the spectral rules apply, some analog thereof. Okay, so I'm just going to keep track of the momentum integrals, the frequency integrals, and all the K parts. Uh, I won't be very, you know, I'll, I'll try to be careful, but I won't go into any details on the K independence. All right, so this is the, the it's the Fourier transform of the retarded commutator. So this is the commutator of the density with itself. 
uh, retarded, meaning that the integral only goes to positive times. Okay, and now the basic trick for everything, uh, for all these spectral representations, and including the fluctuation dissipation theorem, uh, is to insert very clever factors of one everywhere in here. So, and what is, the, and how would we represent unity? Well, let's imagine we knew the complete set of many body eigenstates. Okay, that's in practice an impossibility, but let's imagine we knew them. Uh, we saw, the only place we know such a thing for an interacting electron system is the, the beta ansatz integrable models. Uh, but these results are extremely general, uh, as you'll see. So let's imagine we knew them. Uh, we put the system in a box, so these states are discrete. Uh, these are the exact many body eigenstates in all of Fox space of the full Hamiltonian. So from just the fact that the Hamiltonian is emission, uh, you have various properties. So these are the eigenstates of H, defines the energies En. They are also normal to each other. Uh, and, they, since it's a, and they form a complete resolution of unity. Okay. And the partition function, Z, is just the sum on N of all the energy eigenstates divided by temperature, exponential of that. All right. So this is really, and finally, the trace of any operator uh, is this. Okay. So these are the basic facts, uh, and we're just going to apply them over and over and again with a little bit of Fourier transformation. That's really all we're doing. Okay, so let's uh, simplify this expression here using these tricks. So what you do is you insert one in between the two rows. So you put a one here, and then this expectation value uh, you write as uh, the trace of, uh, so one more trick we are using, uh, is that the expectation value of any operator uh, is one over Z times sum on the energy eigenstates of E to the minus E N over T of the expectation value of the operator in the state N. Okay, so you replace the expectation value by this trick. It's the expectation value at any temperature. We're going to work at final general temperature here. If you are at zero temperature, you just replace the N by this this n by the ground state. Okay. Uh, so you do that here and you put one here. And so you get two sets of complete sets of states that we call them n and m. And then you can evaluate all the matrix elements. So if you do that, uh, you get this expression. So there's the Boltzmann sum of the states n. Then there's various exponential factors that come from the time evolution of these operators which you can write as e to the, you know, uh, so rho of k and t. This is the full Heisenberg time evolution. Is the Heisenberg, the Schrodinger operator times, uh, okay, now I I always forget the signs, but I think that's e to the minus iht, e to the iht. And then when you take the matrix elements, you put a state n here, state n here, this is an eigenstate that gives you a factor of e to the minus uh, e to the minus i e n over t. Okay, h bar is one. All right, so that way you will get these exponentials of differences of energies because you get one exponential from the front and another exponential from the back. Uh, and then this minus sign comes with minus sign inside the commutator here. Okay. All right, so uh, so that's the expression now, written in terms of these uh, exact eigenstates and uh, eigen energies, which we don't know. All right, so if you look at this now, finally, however, uh, life is simple enough that I can do the time integral because I'm just integrating exponentials. Uh, and to make sure the integrals converge, I have to put a slight convergence factor uh, and therefore, I put in this i eta. I just put in a convergence factor of e to the minus eta t uh, out front. Uh, I put in a factor of e to the minus eta t, where eta is going to go to zero and then do the integral. And then I have to just remember that I have to take the limit eta going to zero in this expression. Okay. Uh, so this is just another way of writing out this thing. And now we have this quantity in the numerator, which we, which is actually very interesting to us, 
It's called the spectral density. Uh, and also I've chosen the factor of pi here and carefully so that if I take the imaginary part of chi, the denominator gives me delta function. Uh, and then in fact, the imaginary part of chi is exactly a of k and omega. So I have an exact expression for the imaginary part of chi. This is for the full Hamiltonian, um, which is given by this. This is a numerator that I have to put in here to get that result. Okay. Now you can see here that this function is actually an odd function of omega, uh, because if you change omega to minus omega, you can compensate for that by changing n and m. Uh, and then when you change n and m, this doesn't change because it's the mod squared, and but this picks up a minus sign. Okay, so that's one important property to remember of the spectral density, that it's an odd function of omega, at least for the density-density correlation function. Uh, and also you take the zero temperature limit. Uh, so in the zero temperature uh, for omega, so, you know, if you take the zero temperature limit, one of these two states, either EM or EN, has to be the ground state. Uh, and if you take omega greater than zero, then you have you find that only EN, if omega is greater than zero, then EN has a lower energy than EM, I think, or the other way around. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, you know, so EM has a lower energy than EN. So you have to put EM equal to zero. Uh, and so that's only this term here. The other term doesn't contribute, and this is the answer. So this is a very simple-looking answer worth remembering. Spectral density is the matrix element between the ground state and some excited state, mod squared, times a delta function uh, that conserves energy. And if you look at this, this is very much the flavor of Fermi's golden rule. And in fact, you could have derived it from a, using Fermi's golden rule argument. You just say you have some time-dependent perturbation, rho of ke to the i omega t. Uh, what's the probability that the system will make a transition and absorb energy, omega? Well, this is it. It's just given by uh, Fermi's golden rule. So this is nothing but Fermi's golden rule. Oops. Oh. Okay. All right, so that's important result number one, that there's a spectral representation of the full chi of k and omega, uh, where you can deduce the numerator basically by Fermi's golden rule. Okay. Then, so now we can uh, use this for all kinds of uh, very interesting relations and important relations. Uh, one is that I want to show you the promised relation between the energy absorption rate uh, and chi of k and omega. Um, and so this, you literally do that using Fermi's golden rule. Uh, so you want to, you have some external perturbation, phi x of k and omega, uh, and you ask how much, what is the rate of change of energy uh, of the system because of the external perturbation. So you do that using Fermi's golden rule. You assume the state is, the system is in state M, and you look for the transition probability that is going to go to state n. So that's a matrix element squared with a two pi. Uh, then you have to have uh, conserve energy. Now you can either absorb or emit energy. So this is the case where you absorb energy. Uh, so you go from EM to EN uh, in both cases. In one case, you absorb energy. The other case, you emit energy. Uh, and these two come in. Now you're computing the rate of change of energy. So you have to weight the transition rate, which is these terms with the energy that you've gained. And this is the energy that you've lost. So you come with a minus sign. Okay, so that's how you get this expression. You have to, you have to be a little careful about the M's and N's and the signs, but literally, you know, so believe me, so I got it right. You start with the state energy EM and you absorb energy omega and go to EN, or you start with the state EM and you go down in energy to a state EN uh, and you lose some energy. Yeah, emit energy, sorry. Okay, so these are like the stimulated, you know, one of them is absorption and the other is uh, stimulated emission. Uh, okay, so the rate of energy absorption rate is given by this. And now, lo and behold, you look at this expression 
Uh, and you see it's exactly this expression here uh, after some, some trivial changes in energy and so on. Uh, and then therefore you can, this is the final expression here. Why isn't that disappearing? Okay, this is the final expression for the energy absorption rate. It's the integral of the modulus of the energy the, of the perturbation you're putting in times omega imaginary part of chi of k and omega. Uh, so, so this gives you a quantitative measure of the dissipation. Okay, so that's what imaginary part of chi times omega is a measure of. Uh, it's like the resistance or the dissipation in the system uh, due to uh, all the transitions between the different levels of your many body system. Okay, so that's the connection between chi of k and omega and the energy absorption. Any questions? Okay, so building up to the fluctuation dissipation theorem, we now have an expression for m chi, and we see precisely why m chi is related to dissipation. Uh, what is fluctuation? Well, fluctuation is measured, one way to measure it, uh, is by the structure factor. So, you know, that's how if you have a, you know, uh, if you have the near the liquid gas critical point, you've learned how to learn about critical opalescence, uh, where the, you know, right near the critical point, the liquid becomes very uh, uh, murky. That's because there's large density fluctuations. And those density fluctuations scatter light, and that's why the system looks murky. So basically, if you just work out in the bound approximation, uh, the scattering probability of light from, from a system, uh, you would conclude if light couples with the density that the scattering cross section is proportional to what's called the structure factor. Uh, and then if you start there, it's very much like the Fermi's golden rule calculation here, but you're doing a slightly different thing. You're not computing the energy absorption rate, you're computing the probability that your external perturbation, which could be uh, X-rays or neutrons or anything, which are coupling in this case to the density, what's the probability they get scattered and what's the cross-section? Well, the scattering cross-section is given by the Born approximation. The Born approximation you know, has certain phase factors and it's got the uh, matrix element squared, basically. Uh, and then if you undo all of that, you can show that the scattering cross-section modulo some phase factor in the front is just given by the density-density correlation function at frequency omega. So now you notice that there's some subtle differences between the expression for chi and the expression for s. The expression for chi had a commutator. Okay, so this had a commutator of rho. You don't have a commutator here. And the expression for S uh, has the integral on time go from minus infinity to infinity, but as here it only goes from zero to infinity. So the scattering cross section, and this could be a fun homework problem, uh, is just the, the Fourier transform of the density density correlation function with no commutator and integral going from minus infinity to infinity. All right. So um, so now we apply the spectral decomposition to this uh, object, just like we did for chi, and you go through the same set of analyses and you end up with this expression. Okay. So now you take this expression and you compare it uh, to this expression here for m chi, this one, uh, and, and you notice that you can relate one to the other. Um, and that gives you the famous fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this is the expression in our conventions. Um, the dynamic structure factor is proportional to the imaginary part of chi uh, times this factor, this Bose factor here, sometimes called the detail balance of Bose factor, one minus e to the minus uh, omega over t. Uh, so now this, the left, uh, this object here uh, is um, is an odd function of omega. It's the same whether you absorb energy or, you know, I mean, it's the same for omega positive and negative. Uh, but the dynamic structure factor 
uh, is definitely not odd uh, because what the structure factor is telling you uh, is the cross section for an external, let's say an electron to scatter off the system by wave vector K and absorb energy omega. So positive omega corresponds to absorption of energy. Uh, or wait, wait a second, have I got that wrong? <laughs> so at zero temperature, uh, you can't absorb energy, you can only emit energy. So the structure factor, uh, well, the structure factor is positive for, okay, so I think I got that wrong. So when omega is positive, uh, this is still okay. Yeah, so sorry, so it's the, uh, this is the advantage of, uh, not absorb, it's emit. Okay, so if you're at zero temperature uh, and you send in a probe, the system is sitting there at zero temperature, you send in a probe. Well, the worst that can happen is that your probe can lose some energy and go out. So there's some probability when you're at zero temperature that you can lose some energy. And that's given by the structure factor at positive energy, positive omega. On the other hand, if you're at finite temperature, uh, then your, you know, your probe can come in you can also gain some energy uh, because the system was in an excited state and the system can go down to the ground state and give the energy to, to whatever scattering off. So negative uh, omega corresponds to probability for absorbing energy. Uh, right. Yeah. So this is the, whether the probe absorbs or emits energy. So the probe emits energy for positive frequency. The system absorbs energy for positive frequency and vice versa for negative frequency. Uh, and if you get confused, as I did, you just, just think about the limit of zero temperature. In the zero temperature, the probe will always lose energy uh, because the system has no energy to give. Uh, okay, so that will get it right, which I did get right eventually. Uh, and, you know, this is also in Raman scattering of light, there's a very similar thing. Uh, the Raman scattering of light of a system is also related to some kind of structure factor. Uh, and there's a uh, probability of light will shift to higher energy, the probability shift to lower energies, and the two are in fact related. So S of K of omega and S of K of minus omega are related to each other by some factor related to this Bose factor. Uh, and that's something you can deduce uh, just by using the fact that this guy uh, is an odd function of frequency. Okay, so that's the famous fluctuation dissipation theorem relating something that measures fluctuation uh, to something that measures dissipation. Uh, and it's really ultimately just coming from the beautiful Kubo formula. Uh, but it's, it's, and it's a very general property of any Hamiltonian system in thermal equilibrium. Um, also, it's interesting to consider the limit where the frequency H bar, so there's a missing H bar here, obviously, because this has to be energy. Uh, so in the limit h bar omega much smaller than kBT, uh, then you can replace the denominator by just uh, when omega much smaller than t by just omega over t. So then this becomes 2t over omega. Uh, and then this relates the dynamic structure factor to the uh, dissipation rate uh, by this factor of 2kt over omega. Okay. Uh, now, I should say that I've been, I haven't kept track of factors of h bar, uh, but it's clear that both chi of k and omega and s of k and omega are perfectly well defined uh, in the classical limit. Uh, and so this is the classical fluctuation dissipation theorem, which, which is actually classically much harder to derive. So we have derived a useful relation classically by taking the h bar omega, h bar going to zero limit of a quantum relation. Uh, and this kind of relation has also been known for a long time. Uh, you know, I guess one early version, the earliest version of it is just the Einstein relation, uh, which relates the diffusivity of a metal to its conductivity. There, the diffusivity is a measure of fluctuations, how much do particles fluctuate uh, when undergoing Brownian motion. Uh, and then the conductivity tells you how the, much that particle will drift in the presence uh, of an electric field. Uh, and there was some argument based upon thermal equilibration that Einstein came up with, which related uh, the diffusivity to the conductivity. 
Uh, another famous example of this is the Johnson Noyquist noise in a wire, which replaced the noise in a wire uh, to the temperature and the resistance. And that's again a fluctuation dissipation relation because the noise uh, is the measure of fluctuation and the resistance is a measure of dissipation. Okay. And there are other examples too, but they all ultimately can be derived from uh, this very fundamental relation, which is both applied both even quantum mechanically. These two are both uh, classical limits of corresponding relations. Actually, the Einstein relation also has a quantum, can be easily generalized to quantum mechanics. All right, so that's uh, a very important set of things that appear in all kinds of domains of physics uh, and are very easily derived by these expressions from the Kubo formula. Okay, so good and important bookkeeping. Any questions? There's a quick question. Sure. So Einstein relation, the uh, fluctuation is a uh, diffusion coefficient. And so diffusion coefficient yes. is, is similar to structure factor that we are talking about right now? It's a different measure of it. Yeah, I mean, if you took the structure fact density density correlation function uh, of, uh, you know, of a bunch of particles undergoing uh, Brownian motion, uh, you will get some diffusion dq squared over omega squared plus dq squared form or something of it. So it will be some function of omega and q which will involve the, uh, the diffusion constant, S of k and omega. Oh, then okay. if you take some limit, omega going to zero, divide by k squared, you'll get diffusion constant on one side. Then if you take the corresponding limit on the right-hand side, uh, you'll get the conductivity from the corresponding Kubo formula for the conductivity. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a much less, you know, Einstein relation is just a relation between two numbers. Uh, this is a relation between uh, two functions, in fact, two functions of two variables. So it's much, much more powerful, and very general. Uh, the Einstein relation is just some limit of this where you send omega to zero and divide by k squared and then send k to zero or something like that on the left and the right hand side. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so this is of course the most general form of it and it relates to functions. And these are much more limited, but earlier uh, examples of this relation of some limits of that relation. Okay, all right, continuing in the theme of very, very general results, uh, there's the F sum rule, another very useful thing we can derive. Uh, so what is the F sum rule? Well, again, you just, uh, you take this expression for chi, uh, this one here again, is that silly red line? Uh, okay, take this expression for chi, and then you notice that if you multiply by omega and integrate over omega, uh, sorry, not that expression, uh, this expression here, the im chi. So you take this expression, um, you multiply this by capital omega, and you integrate over omega. Okay. So if you do that, uh, so you just take that expression for m chi, multiply by omega, and integrate from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, then the delta function gets resolved, and will just give you a factor of e n minus e m, because that's what this omega equals, e n minus e m. And there's various signs you have to keep track of. Okay, and now, you notice something interesting. Now I can, I'm going to undo everything I did. You know, I started with the commutator and I inserted one in various places. Uh, and that's how I got in the expression for m of chi and k and omega. And I'm sorry, that has to be omega. Okay, so that's how I got the expression for m of chi and k and omega by just inserting uh, these, these identities uh, all over the place. And now I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to undo all of these identities and see what I get. Okay, 
And it turns out for this particular combination, uh, it simplifies enormously. So first thing you do uh, is you just uh, you take this term here. So you open up this thing. You open up this thing uh, by writing this as, uh, you know, n rho m and m rho of minus k and n because that's the Hermitian conjugate. Okay, so that's, and then you realize that en minus em can be written as this commutator here. Because of the h acts on this side, you get an en. It acts on this side, you get an em. Uh, and so if you just open up this thing, that give you exactly that factor and this matrix element. Okay, so now you get rid of this factor by writing it as a commutator. And, uh, and then you do the same thing for the other term here, which is done over here. And now you look at these two, and what you realize is that if I change, in this second expression, I change n to m. Okay, so this becomes em. And you pull out a factor of em, uh, and then you put everything else in the center, you put an M here and an M here. And then you'll find that if you look at the structure of this thing, uh, in the center, all, what you have uh, is in fact sum on N, oops, uh, sum on N, N, N. And you just replace that by one, just remove it. Uh, so you get rid of the sum over N. And there was a sum over N here, but now that disappears. Uh, and so you end up with this expression, where there's only one sum over m. And now you notice that the sum over m is just an expectation value, and this thing is another commutator. So the, the when the dust settles, this is again extremely general, uh, this result is just this double commutator. Commutator of rho with h, and then a commutator of that again with rho. Okay. And the expectation value. So this particular uh, expression is the expectation value of this operator. In fact, you can do this for other powers of omega here. You get other more complicated operators. Uh, so this is the very general feature that you can take frequency integrals of the imaginary part of chi and relate it to multiple commutators that you can then try to evaluate. The, the nice thing about these commutators, they're correlated that there's no time evolution. You just evolve them at in thermal equilibrium. They're equal time thermodynamic quantities that you can evaluate. Now in general, uh, this is a horrible expression which will depend upon everything in the system. I mean, it's not got any time evolution, but it's still hard to evaluate. It's still some equilibrium thermodynamic property uh, which will depend on the interactions and everything else. Okay, but it turns out that for Coulomb interactions, uh, and for the Jellium model, uh, which is also true for other, for band structure, uh, that um, life simplifies a lot. And that's because the Coulomb interaction depends on the density only. And so the Coulomb interaction computes with the density. So the interaction term just drops out in this expression. So all we have to do is take the kinetic energy in the Hamiltonian and then compute this commutator. Now for a, a lattice model, you get some general more complicated expression, uh, but for K-squared dispersion, if you take this dispersion and evaluate this double commutator, uh, another great homework problem, now that I think of it, uh, you get an expression which is just, which is just this, where this is the density at zero momentum, uh, K-squared over M. And it's independent of temperature, independent of the interaction, independent of everything. Only depends on the bare electron mass, uh, not the renormalized quasi-particle mass, the momentum k squared, and the average density. So there's our epsom rule. Uh, it tells you that the uh, this integral of m of chi and omega is minus n k squared over n. Okay, uh, so this is a, another you know very important rule. And there's analog of it in many other observables, which you can derive in corresponding ways. For example, if you have an atom and you're sending in some light, you get a bunch of spectral weights, spectral lines. 
uh, then you can ask what is the integral, what is the total absorption integral? And that's related by essentially an argument very much like this. Uh, the, the, the integral under all the spectral lines is given by some expression, which is called the F sub rule in atomic physics, which is why it's been called that here. Uh, if you look at the conductivity of a material uh, under certain conditions, you're looking at sigma of omega, the conductivity, you see how it absorbs light at different frequencies uh, of a metal. And then the integral under that expression is also constrained in some way by the F sub rule uh, and so on. Uh, in fact, for us, uh, it also is very important for plasmons. It constrains some properties of plasmons. Uh, in fact, tells us that the plasma frequency that we got, if you remember the frequency was four pi n e squared over m, uh, it's actually an exact result. It's true for independent of any interactions and the m that appears in the plasma frequency uh, is not the quasi particle mass, but the bare mass of the electron. So how can we see that? So how does that work? So you take now that I've introduced, go taking this quantity, let me put this in the real part, the full chi, uh, k and omega, uh, which is then given by the, well, this is what's called the dispersion relation. This is of course a relationship we began this lecture with, uh, this relationship right here. I'm just using this. Okay, uh, Kramer's chronic relation is another word for it. Okay, so this tells me, now I look at this expression, and now I send little omega to very large values. Okay, so I just expand this by this uh, usual binomial expansion. And then what happens? Well, the first term uh, is independent of capital omega. And now this integral is running from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, this is an odd function, so I'll get zero. So this term won't contribute. So the first term that contributes is this. You get an omega in the numerator, wonderful, because that's exactly what appears in the F sum rule. So now I can use the F sum rule uh, to figure out the coefficient of one over omega squared. So then here's my uh, very important answer then. In any system, well, sorry, in the Jellia model, sorry, uh, for the full exact chi of k and omega, uh, whatever it is, as omega goes to infinity, um, it should be nk squared over m omega squared. Okay. Now, where did we use this result before? Well, it came in uh, in our discussion of plasmons. So when we got the plasma frequency, we said that this chi naught here in the full response function, I'm going to replace by n q squared over m omega squared. Um, that was perfectly okay to do, but it was an approximation because you were replacing it by this kind of. Okay, now we actually, we need a bit more diagrams to see this correctly, but this is not an approximation at all. Uh, it's exact. Uh, and therefore this expression for the plasma frequency here uh, is totally exact. There are no corrections to it. And in fact, the fact that it's totally exact is something that's more evident from this argument. You know, this, this, this is a perfectly exact argument for an oscillation. And you know that the electric field has to be related to the density by this formula by Gauss's law and nothing else was required. Uh, and we're talking about center of mass motion of some, some uh, piece of electron. So the electron interactions, the mutual interactions shouldn't make any difference to the center of mass motion either. So that's, kind of a more physical way to see why this result is completely exact. Uh, but the F sum rule gives you some more formal uh, description of that. Okay, I think that concludes this chapter. I, yeah, all I wanted to say from, uh, again, it's, uh, you know, it's a big subject with many different sum rules and uh, fluctuation dissipation theorems, uh, but, they're all derived in the same way. And I've just given you an example of how it's done for the simplest case of the density-density correlation function. And the structure of the relations are very, very similar to what we've just discussed. Any questions? 
Okay, then, moving right along. Uh, finally, we are going to begin the formal part of the course, talk about Green's functions and Feynman diagrams. So what we're going to, just to give you a picture of where we're going with this, uh, we're going to develop this formalism in the, over the next two or three lectures. Um, and that will allow us, in fact, to rederive everything we derived so far uh, using by drawing some pictures and evaluating graphs, whereas we did it already by just some mean field arguments. Uh, so that's good we can do that because it gives us some confidence in what we've done. It also shows in principle what the corrections are. How do we, you know, we've done something so far, but we have no idea how to correct it. It was just based on some rather ad hoc um, variational principles. So you can keep improving the variational principle a little bit, but you don't know what you know, that there's genuinely new effects that you're entirely missing. So this formalism tells you at least in principle how to correct it. Uh, although, you know, the work required is still quite considerable to go beyond what we've done. Uh, but at least in principle, you know how to how it proceeds. Um, and uh, yeah, um, and it gives you, a, you know, a very nice language uh, of talking about things where you can draw a few pictures rather than uh, constantly writing out know, these complicated equations that we've been dealing with. Okay. Now, also, many, many of the older books uh, derived this formalism uh, because I think people then were more influenced by particle physics, or quantum field theory books, uh, using Feynman prescriptions for Green's functions and working at real time. Uh, and that whole formalism uh, is needlessly confusing. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's got all these limits that you have to take of epsilons going to zero and, uh, you know, things going to minus time minus infinity where the interactions were turned off and then they're turned on adiabatically. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's all introduces a whole layer of complexity that's in fact totally unnecessary. Uh, it sort of seems to imply that this formalism only appears in thermal equilibrium and truly infinite system, none of which is true. This formalism applies very generally, even in a finite system, even a single atom, you can use Green's functions and Wick's theorem, no problem. Uh, and to really see it in the simpler way, which is the way, you know, I think in my life, as a condensed matter theorist, is the way I've always done the calculation. Uh, is to you have to uh, for a while get a little unphysical and work in imaginary time, uh, because in imaginary time the formulae are completely rigorous and easily derived. Uh, there's no limiting procedure required, and then if you want to compute the physical correlation functions, well, we'll see that those are just given by some tricks, very similar to the tricks you've gone through so far. That is just that we related M of chi to S of K and omega. There are similar relations that relate uh, imaginary time Green's function to real time Kubo type Green's function that relate to experiments. Uh, and all the limiting procedures are just reduced to putting I eta's in various spectral functions <laughs> and when the time comes. All right, so that, so I'm gonna present this the way I think it should be presented, and the more modern books at least do it this way, at least partly, uh, which is in imaginary time. Okay, uh, so that's point number one. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll develop, so what will, so another, yeah, so we'll develop in imaginary time, uh, and let's see how it goes. So first of all, uh, let me just recall, uh, the various pictures, the Heisenberg picture, the interaction picture, and the Schrodinger picture, but now we cast to imaginary time. Okay, so you have some, op let's start with the Schrodinger picture where operator is a time independent. So A is some operator and your wave function is going to obey the Schrodinger equation. So formally, I'm just going to de define uh, the time evolution of that operator, A of tau, where tau is a real number, uh, by this operator here, with an e to the minus tau h here and e to the tau h here. Now, if I put tau imaginary, this is exactly the Heisenberg time evolution. 
So this is why you can think of this imaginary time evolution in the Heisenberg picture. Okay. So that's definition one, completely analogous to what we did for the interaction picture. Uh, now, invariably for all of diagrams, there's always this decomposition uh, where you write a Hamiltonian as some uh, simple Hamiltonian whose time evolution you know. Typically, that's just the kinetic energy and some interaction V, which is the hard part. And the whole purpose of this procedure is sort of like, you know, perturbation theory that you learn in quantum mechanics at the very beginning is to expand in powers of V. Now, when you learn quantum mechanics, you know, you learn at the most first order of corrections and maybe a second order corrections. And then you just look at the book. So the third order correction and looks this horribly complicated formula. Uh, uh, this particular formalism is actually much more efficient. It can give you the general expression for the nth order correction to any order you wish, uh, not just for time independent, but for time dependent perturbations. Uh, and even more, it can do it in terms of pictures. So, so that's why we want to learn it. <laughs> so let's imagine H is split into this form. Then in the interaction representation of uh, A hat of tau is the same as this thing with H replaced by H naught. Okay. So the key object in our discussion will be this time evolution operator, which is in the interaction picture U hat. Uh, and it's this particular operator. You can view this as the definition of it. It goes from time tau prime to tau. Uh, it's the Eugenberg, uh, Heisenberg time evolution in imaginary time, which is e to the minus iht from tau prime to tau. Uh, and then I have these factors here, uh, which undo the time evolution in h naught. So if h was equal to h naught, this would be equal to one. So u hat only depends on v. So that's the reason for putting these factors in. Uh, notice I can't commute, the ordering is extremely important and I cannot take this out here and write them as one common factor of tau minus tau prime times H naught. I can't do that. And so in fact, this operator really depends on two times tau and tau prime. Okay, so that's the definition. Uh, and from this definition, we can uh, derive other expressions for this unitary time evolution operator. Uh, but before I derive that expression, why why do I define it? Why is this useful? Well, because it uh, first of all obeys this property, this group property, easy to check. U of tau one tau two is tau one tau three times tau three tau two. So if you evolve from this time to that time, you can go to some intermediate time, and then go evolve next. Or you can even go into the future and come back. It doesn't matter. There's no particular time ordering here. Uh, so you, that's easy to check from here. And you can also check from this, uh, this relation. So if you want to relate the time evolution you want for the full Hamiltonian to the time evolution you know, which is for the uh, A hat operator. So you can go from the time evolution you want to the time evolution you know by inserting uh, two factors of the u hat uh, here. So you put a, you start from any time you want, it doesn't have to be zero. u hat of zero tau, take a hat, no, actually no, you do have to start from zero, sorry. Zero to tau, a hat of tau, and then tau to zero. And you just plug these things in and you see that's correct. Okay. Uh, next, you take this u hat op object and write down an equation of motion for this. We did this in the imaginary time earlier. Uh, so you look at the differential equation. Uh, you'll find when you take the derivative with respect to tau, keeping track of all the orderings and just simplifying a little bit, uh, that it's just given by this. So that verifies where this is v hat. So when v hat uh, is zero, uh, if there's no perturbation, then u hat is just one. Okay. So the only time evolution of this is this equation. And we've learned how to integrate these equations. Uh, it's just put it up in an exponential and integrate with a time ordering symbol out front. So this is our, our compact expression to all orders in the perturbation um, of this time evolution operator in the interaction representation in imaginary time. 
Okay. Uh, and this will be the the object we'll use to to generate all the Feynman diagrams. You just expand the exponential, and then you draw pictures to represent each term. And that will be pretty much it. Okay. All right. Uh, one other useful representation of uh, useful property of use you can put to this imaginary time operator to compute something physical. Uh, you can compute the partition function, trace e to the minus beta h, uh, where this is explicitly now beta looks like an imaginary time. And that's in fact part of the reason for using imaginary time, although not the only reason. Uh, it allows you to very easily get expressions that hold not only at zero temperature, but at finite temperature. Uh, because you can just see right here, the finite temperature is explicitly imaginary time. So if I'm looking at a thermodynamic quantity, uh, like the partition function, you can see it's given by this. So I, I want to take trace e to the minus beta h. So you just look at this expression here. Uh, you can put tau prime equal to zero, uh, and then you want to cancel this term out. Uh, and then you get e to the minus beta h, where tau is equal to beta. So the so the partition function is the average value of the time evolution operator from time zero to beta. Okay, so that's another very useful picture we're going to have. Uh, and and there's a trace here, so it's sort of like time is moving in a circle. So time moves in a circle, starts at zero and comes back to beta. Uh, and uh, this trace over the circle gives you the z. Uh, so that's a nice pictorial way of thinking about what the partition function is. You just evolve an imaginary time on a circle and come back to the same state. You come back to the same state because you're taking the trace. Okay, let's just. Uh, <laughs> this is the correct formula. If you get confused by the picture, don't worry about it. This is the formula that we're going to try to evaluate. All right, so that I think I'll stop there. That's just an introduction to time evolution in imaginary time and how the time evolution operator in imaginary time average value is in fact just the partition function. Okay. Any comment or question? All right, then our problem set three is going to be uh, put on the website today if it hasn't already. Uh, and problem set two is due today. And uh, I will have a discussion session tonight. Uh, although, you know, the response this uh, for the discussions has been rather smaller this term than last term. Uh, I'm wondering whether I should change it to some more convenient time. So let me know if you, if you have other times you'd prefer. Okay. See you soon then.